So we're going to continue to do these. This is the second in the series, and the next one is going to be Tony Frost, but we'll talk about that later. Um, this evening's program is going to have a couple of uh, key components, really two parts. The first one is Naraj is going to give his presentation, and then followed by uh, an overview of the Executive MBA program. And we'll give you some updates with that and what's happening with the program. Uh, also featured during the during the uh, both of the discussions tonight will be current students and alumni. So I think you're going to really enjoy hearing their comments about both Naraj's book and as well the um, their experiences. In terms of Naraj, I'd like to introduce Professor Marketing Professor Naraj Dawar. Naraj has been at Ivy since 1993. Sorry, 1996. Um, he has, he's actually a man that has truly lived around the world. He's lived on three different continents, ten countries. So ten countries, uh, four of them in Asia, and all those countries he's lived for over a year in each of them. So he truly has seen trends and key shifts happen around the globe. Uh, in addition to teaching since uh, 96 with Ivy, he is also, he also does a lot of consulting, so he's worked with companies like Microsoft, BMW, L'Oreal, McCain, and others. He continues to work with them. Of course, what he's been working on recently, and he told me his regime to get this book completed, and it was amazing. A year, three hours a day, I think, for almost a year. So you can see what, what it takes, and you can see the, the, what that's resulted in and some of his insights. Um, the book itself has been one of the best sellers on Amazon since it came out. It was number four on Forbes' must read for 2013. It was the number one book on a, a site in, uh, part of the Entrepreneur Association in England. And so it's been getting rave reviews and Naraj was sharing with me that he gets a letter, a note at least every day or a couple of notes every day from people who are saying this book has changed. Not only they're thinking about marketing, but it's changing their approach to the company. So without further ado, Naraj, take it away. Good evening, everybody. Let me, uh, let me start with a, a short exercise. Now, I'm going to be talking about my book, and I'll also be sort of drawing on some of the concepts that I, I wrote about in a Harvard Business Review article that appeared about six months ago in the December issue. But before I jump into that, I'm going to ask you to engage in an exercise. And we'll try, we'll try the exercise now, a short exercise. And then at the end of the session, we'll repeat the exercise and see if your answers change. OK? So here's how we're going to do it. I'm going to ask you to uh, speak to the people in your row. So engage in a conversation with people in your row. And the question is, what brands from China, what companies from China come to mind? Which one brand is likely to be the most global? five years from now. So I want you to answer the question, which Chinese brand or company is likely to be the most global five years from now? Okay, let's discuss that among your, among the people in your role. Two minutes. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
So once he put the factory in, and he put in a whole bunch of rooms and weaving machines and so on, he started to produce textiles that were that cost 90% less than textiles that were produced where the machines were in individual households, for example. By building a factory, he cut costs <coughs> per unit of output by 90%. What is that called? Economies of scale. Right? So he built economies of scale. By building a factory, he essentially invented the idea of economies of scale in practice. I mean, in theory, it had been around, but in practice, he's the one who invented that. But economies of scale come with a downside a potential problem. What is that problem? Yeah? Discrepancies in quality. Actually, the other way around. In fact, uh, by putting a factory in, he was able to standardize quality, which was very difficult to standardize when the machines were individually run. So he improved quality. So what, you know, you, you build a factory, you put in so this is one of his factories. I mean, this is a refurbished version of one of his factories, the Sir Richard Hartwright. I mean, you know, he, was, he started off as a barber. A barber who realized that there was a revolution happening in the textile industry, so he started factories. And very soon, within seven years, he had 140 factories strewn around, around Britain. All of them financed, but with borrowed money. Now that should give you a hint about what factories do, the downside of factories. The downside, you lose individualism. Yeah, now, <laughs> <laughs> and you have to work, you know, on regular shifts. And <laughs> uh, no, but what else, what else? What else? What? You can know what that. You accumulate debt. You accumulate debt. In other words, you put in all this money or all this capital into the factory, and it's borrowed money. So what do you have to do at the end of the month? Pay interest. In other words, you've created fixed costs. You have to pay interest. Yes? I run a manufacturing business. So to me, the downside is, uh, like you just said, if you realize you, 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 you can produce the same thing using the factory with a scale, you can produce it much cheaper. So the pricing concept becomes... Uh, it becomes difficult to sustain margins. Uh, yes, and because people do have certain expectation yeah. in terms of your pricing. Right. So, uh, so, so they expect you to cut price. Yeah, the competition. 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 Interest for the uh, um, produce the same product over and over, which right. is large volume at the end. Yeah, yeah. So the okay. So but now you've got all these fixed costs. At the end of the month, you have to pay the interest and you have to pay some of the principal back, regardless of how much you sell. So one question starts to drive business. One question. One question is. How much more of this stuff can we sell? That one question has become the driving force of all strategy, all business, for 250 years. As scale rolled from textiles to chemicals to the production of just about everything, scale invaded industry after industry, soaps and Automobiles eventually, everything became produced in a factory. And when that happened, the question that drove every single business was, how much more of this stuff can we sell? In other words, it became a capacity utilization based business. That central question is fundamental to strategy even today. Most businesses are driven by the question, how much more of this stuff can we sell? In the 21st century, the 21st century Arkwright, who is the 21st century Arkwright? 
There are hundreds of them in China, but there is one who stands out. 21st Century Archives is not Steve Jobs. The 21st Century Archives, in terms of having built large factories in order to benefit from economies of scale, the 21st Century Archive is a Taiwanese gentleman. So he's the 21st Century Archive. And, and as I said, there are hundreds of such uh, entrepreneurs in China who have built large scale in order to serve, serve markets. In fact, if you go to Datan, for example, there are three factories, very large factories, that make most of the socks that the whole planet consumes. So scale has been built in China. But what has happened is that scale has been commoditized in China in the 21st century. So for 250 years, scale was a competitive advantage. For 250 years, Arkwright's principle that, this, that if you build scale, you will have competitive advantage, that principle started consolidation and size in industry after industry. And in fact, even today, we're seeing consolidation happening because of Arkwright's principle of scale. But in China, what has happened is that because they've built such large scale, and now anybody can go and benefit from that scale, anybody can go and you know, have the benefit of the, event, of the large scale production by contracting. So anybody who wants to build a brand, any private label, any retailer around the world, any brand, in fact, that wants access to the economies of scale, goes to China, buys a small part of the production volume spewing out of these factories, puts their own brand on it, and sells it. What has happened is that scale suddenly is no longer a competitive advantage. Scale has been commoditized. So in fact, the idea of scale suddenly becomes, for 250 years, was the competitive advantage, that idea has suddenly become commoditized. So the question is, what's next? And this question is not just an academic question. It's not just an academic, you know, I'm an academic, and I'm just an academic. But it's not just an academic question. This question is more important in the sense that it's important to companies such as these. It is important to their strategy. It's important to how they will how will, how they will survive and thrive over the next 50 to 20 years. It's also important to companies such as these. These are some more upstart types of uh, companies. It is important to how they will survive and thrive over the next uh, 20 to 25 years. What is their source of competitive advantage? Where should they be looking for advantage once scale? has been commoditized. You know, 100 years ago, as the railways opened up the United States, markets opened up. When those markets opened up, a revolution took place in the world of marketing. People started to build national brands that had huge economies of scale. And that was an interesting development, because that is the reason why today all of us wear Levi's jeans. That's the reason why we all have Kellogg's cereals for breakfast. That's the reason why we have Heinz ketchup. Because 100, 120, 125 years ago, as the railways opened up national markets, it became economical to build national brands. And the national brands that built their, you know, built their awareness, built advertising, those are the ones that went international. And those are the ones that survived and thrived. Chinese companies today face a similar critical juncture where they have the scale, they have the large domestic market, they have the ability to build brands domestically. But the question is, what do they do next once scale has been commoditized, once everybody has access to scale, once each one of their competitors also has access to the same economies of scale, what do they do? And I suggest that they need to take take cognizance of, take, you know, be aware of three shifts that have happened, and also be, a, you know, be ready to take seven steps. And I'm going to walk you through those three shifts and the seven steps. 
the three shifts and the seven steps to nirvana. Okay. So, shift number one. You see, every business can be divided up into various components, various activities that uh, contribute to the value that is created. So this is the value creation process. And this value creation process includes sourcing, it includes R&D, new product development, supply chains, logistics. It includes customer acquisition, customer satisfaction, and customer retention. So on the right side, we have what I call downstream activities, activities that are closer to customers. And on the left side, we have upstream activities, activities that are related to products and production, that are related to factories, features, innovation. So once we start to divide those, I think one of the questions that we need to ask ourselves is do each of our activities does each of these activities contribute equally to the value that is created? And the answer is clearly no. Does each of these activities contribute equally to the costs of the company? And the answer is clearly no. Does each of these activities contribute equally to the competitive advantage of the company? And the answer is clearly no. So where does the center of gravity of each of these things reside on this spectrum of value creation. And my, my sort of observation, and from studying patterns in various industries, I've identified three shifts. And one is that costs are moving downstream. The upstream has been streamlined. Scale economies have been delivered. Uh, you can outsource the upstream to a third party contractor that is a specialist. So the upstream has been commoditized, and what has happened is that the downstream now accounts for a larger and larger share of total costs. And the downstream, customer acquisition, things like brand building, things like uh, loyalty programs, things like market research, those are increasingly a larger share of our total costs than the upstream activities. So costs have shifted downstream. The second shift is that customer value has shifted downstream. In other words, the customers pay for, they come back for, and they pay a premium for activities that happen in the downstream, more so than activities that happen in the upstream. In other words, customers are willing to pay much more become loyal for things that you do in the downstream. If you were to think about what you sell and how the customer buys, consumes that, the what is products and technologies and the how is the customer interface, and it is in the how that increasingly customer value resides. And let me give you an example of that. Here's three restaurants in Hong Kong. If you go to Gold, you buy this bottle of wine, and Chateau Margaux 1983. This bottle of wine is on the menu at gold for 10,000 Hong Kong dollars. The same bottle of wine, exactly the same bottle of wine, is at L'Atelier on the menu at 14,000 Hong Kong dollars. And here, at Caprice, in this building, <laughs> the same bottle of wine, the Chateau Margaux 1983, is on the menu for 20,000 Hong Kong dollars. So the what is constant. What changes is the how. In other words, the value that customers are willing to pay for, the premiums that they're willing to pay, the reason they're willing to be loyal, it resides increasingly in the how rather than the what. Let me give you another example. And here I'll show you a little video about tilt. And it captures the idea once again. We have the uh... <clears throat> yeah, I have a PhD. I have a problem. Now we need to increase the volume, please. Yeah, thank you. 
Flavel, the celebrated virtuoso violinist, fills symphony halls with adoring audiences paying one to two hundred dollars a seat. But one day, he was asked by the Washington Post to participate in a social experiment. He was asked to play incognito as a busker at a subway station in Washington, D.C. The experiment sought to find out how many morning commuters would stop to listen to Bell play his 300-year-old Stradivarius in mundane conditions. The result? In over 40 minutes of playing, almost no one stopped. You can buy a burger at McDonald's for about $3, or you can splurge at a BLT burger and pay five times as much. The same product, whether it's Joshua Bell playing the violin or a burger, commands very different responses and prices because the buyer pays not just for what they buy, but importantly, for how they buy it. Often, the portion of the price the buyer pays for the how is much larger than the price they pay for the what. Consider that in almost any city in the world, you can buy a can of Coke at a supermarket as part of a multi-pack for about 25 cents. But on a hot day in the park, you gladly drop $2 in a vending machine for a chilled can of Coke. This 700% price premium you pay is for the benefit of having the Coke delivered to you chilled in a single serve at the point of thirst. So you don't have to remember to carry a cola can around and find a way to keep it chilled. Over the past 15 years, I've asked thousands of managers in dozens of industries across the globe a couple of questions. What business are you in? And why do your customers buy from you? The answer to the first question invariably is about the product. We're in the business of software, window frames, PVC pipes and fittings, we're a bank, and so on. The answer to the second question, why do your customers buy from you rather than from your competitors, is almost never because we have a better product, or even we charge a lower price. The answers, it turns out, are they trust us. We make it easy for the customer. We're reliable. We have a reputation. Our brand is strong. In other words, customers buy, remain loyal, and pay premium prices because of the how, not the what. Yet companies spend inordinate amounts of time, resources, and effort on their products rather than on the how. They see themselves through the lenses of their product rather than through the eyes of their customer. They are obsessed with the upstream parts of their business where products and production dominate rather than the downstream parts of their business where customers and customer concerns are paramount. Sales is a book that guides managers to shift their business's center of gravity, to build lasting customer value, and find competitive advantage in the how in their downstream activities. Take control of your center of gravity. So the, set, so the first shift was costs has shifted downstream. The second shift is that value has shifted downstream. Increasingly, customers are willing to pay for stuff that happens in the downstream, for activities that happen in the downstream. The third shift is that competitive advantage, the sources of competitive advantage have shifted downstream. And what this means is you know, things like Alibaba does not sell better products. It sells products better. And that means that its competitive advantage resides in the how rather than in the what. What makes it different from competitors is what it does in the downstream rather than in the upstream. Dell doesn't sell better computers. It sells computers better. Lenovo doesn't sell better computers, it sells computers better. And so what they do in the downstream is what differentiates them, and that's what is their source of competitive advantage. So the, there's been a tilt. Those three things have shifted downstream. Now, I'm going to look at seven steps, seven steps that companies, Chinese companies can engage in in order to build competitive advantage, and as role models, they can look to companies such as Samsung and Hyundai, although I believe that even these two companies can benefit from the use of the seven steps, and there are some of those steps that these two companies do not do, but let's, let's walk through the seven steps. The first step will be familiar to the students in the Ember class this time. And that is, catch the wave. Find a wave and catch it. Figure out what's happening in the larger environment. And so each of these companies needs to find a wave to which they're going to dedicate their resources and to which they're going on, on the platform of which they're going to build their brand. So for example, they could capture 
they could ride the wave of cloud computing. This is a gigantic wave happening in the computer industry, in the information business. They could just latch onto it and they would then benefit from standards, from larger companies, become part of a value chain. There are lots of benefits to riding that wave. They could latch on to the wave of the Internet of Things. And as that happens and unfolds, they will benefit from future growth. They will benefit from all of the advantages that come from riding a wave. There are waves of, for example, the sharing economy. And we know companies such as Uber and Airbnb, for example, are riding the wave of the sharing economy. There's 3D printing, which is also a huge wave that's happening right now. There's the environment and sustainability, and we know that electric cars, for example, are, are riding the wave of greater uh, importance that is placed on environmentally friendly products. So the first is right away. The second, and this is much more difficult, and only leaders, market leaders, are successful in doing this. This is a much more difficult sort of uh, hurdle to meet. And that is, don't just ride the wave, define the wave. What this means is, innovations don't succeed through better products. Innovations succeed because you have managed to capture the imagination of customers. And you have managed to convince customers that your products, your features, your criteria of purchase matter more than anybody else's. So here's an example. We've known for the last 25 to 30 years, we've known that Gillette is, you know, their next innovation is going to be one more blade, <laughs> one more cutting edge. We've known that for 25 to 30 years. We are up now to something like 11 or 12 blades. <laughs> so, so we've known that, but their competitors have also known that. So why is it, let me ask you, why is it that none of the competitors has preempted Gillette and introduced an expert blade before Gillette? Why has that not happened? Everybody has known for the last 25 to 30 years that it's going to have one more blade next to it. So why has a competitor not preempted Gillette? And the answer is, it turns out, that even if they did, it wouldn't matter. Customers wouldn't buy it. Customers wouldn't believe in it. It's not credible. In other words, four blades are better than three, but only if Gillette says so. <laughs> and that, that is defining the wave. In other words, whatever wave is happening, you don't just ride the wave, you define the wave. You own customers' criteria of purchase. And so it's not just through innovation, but through owning customer criteria. Remember, innovation happens in the R&D lab. Owning customers' reasons for upgrading, reasons for changing, reasons for spending more, that happens in the downstream. That's a downstream activity. <coughs> so why do innovations succeed? Not because you have a better product, but because you're able to convince customers to buy the product that you're introducing. Step three is find your center of gravity. If every firm has a center of gravity. Do you know where your center of gravity is? Do you know where the burden of your fixed costs resides? Do you know which activities your customers value the most? Do you know where your competitive advantage is built and sustained? So those are the questions you need to be able to address in order to figure out where your center of gravity is. And so do you know where your center of gravity Ask yourself, monitor your center of gravity, understand your center of gravity relative to the center of gravity of competitors. Understand the center of gravity of the industry. Is it upstream or downstream? Is it changing over time? Is your center of gravity changing over time? Is your competitor's center of gravity changing over time? And those are important questions because they determine where you will allocate resources. They determine how you manage. So where's your center of gravity? That's step three. Determine your center of gravity, monitor your center of gravity, manage your center of gravity. Step four is from scale to scope. So scale was 
a fantastic source of competitive advantage for 250 years. But now, instead of asking how much more of this stuff can we sell, we should be asking what else do our customers need? How much more of this stuff can we sell is a capacity utilization question. It's a volume question. It's a question related to economies of scale. What else do our customers need is a question related to scope. It's related to the range of products that you build. So think about it. If strategy for 250 years has been built around the question of how much more of this stuff can we sell, and now strategy starts to be determined by the question, what else do our customers need? The product range that we produce will change. Earlier, the emphasis was on as narrow a range as possible of standardized products. The answer to the second question, however, is find a way to serve customers in broad ranges of products because once you've built the platform of relationship with the customer, you have to ask what else can be sell them, rather than how much more of this stuff can be sell them. You might ask that too, but the range question starts to come into focus scope question as opposed to the scale question. So now you're aiming for economies of scope. Step number five is instead of asking what else can we make, so we're going from core competencies. Our range of products used to be determined by our core competencies. We know how to do this, therefore we should continue to make that. And so from core competencies to we're looking at customer connections. So instead of asking what else can we make, we should be asking what else can we do for our customers. Instead of just asking can we sell better products, we should be asking the downstream question of should, can we sell the products better. Let me give you an example here. Now this, the picture is related to the automobile industry. I'll give you an example from the automobile industry, but not electrical cars. Electric cars. About 10 years ago, there was a gentleman by the name of Wolfgang, Wolfgang Reitzler. He used to be a BMW executive, a senior executive at BMW. And he then became the uh, CEO of Ford Automobiles Premier Auto Group. And the Premier Auto Group is premier brands or luxury brands such as the Aston Martin, uh, Land Rover, um, Range Rover. Volvo was also part of that group at that time. Uh, Lincoln and Jaguar, those were the brands as part of the premier order. That group of brands served a segment of customers that were affluent, urban, and mobile. They would move around from one city to another. So they needed a car in New York one day, in Dubai the next day, in uh, Shanghai the third day. And they, they needed different cars at different times. They needed a convertible for their beach holiday. And they needed a four by four SUV for their skiing holiday. And they needed a long car with a long wheelbase to drive on the highway. And they needed a small car when they parked in the city, go into the city to park. So they, they you know, they have different needs, varying needs. Custom, this customer segment, the urban mobile affluent segment has different needs, but we sell them a rigid solution. We sell them a metal box on four wheels, and we sell it to them in one location, when in fact their needs are varied. They have needs in different cities for different cars. For so Wolfgang Reitzler suggested a solution. He said, you know what, instead of making a car that is flexible, that changes form or shape or depending on the need, why don't we sell them a mobility contract? Instead of selling them a car, we sell them a mobility contract. And the mobility contract will give them a convertible when they ask for it, an SUV when they land in Dubai or Dallas. They will have the car they want when they want it. With 24 hour notice, they can have whatever car there is in our stable, as long as they only have one car at one time. And there you have a way of selling products better rather than 
producing better products. In other words, this solution was not developed, this innovation was not developed in the factory. It's not a better car, but it's a better way of selling the car so that customers have access to the car they need when they need it. Step seven is build advantage outside the firm. In other words, your competitive advantage no longer resides inside your four walls. Your competitive advantage resides outside of your company. In fact, it resides often in the relationship with customers. It resides in the minds of customers. Your competitive advantage is out there. You know, Elvis Presley, at the end of every concert, uh, the audience would stay in their seats, shouting, Elvis, 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 and hoping he might do an encore hoping he might come back on stage, hoping he would sing one more song. <coughs> but Elvis had to leave at some point. So his organizers started to announce at the end of every concert, Elvis has left the building. I have news for you. Your competitive advantage has left the building. And in fact, it's not coming back. So. Your competitive advantage resides in the minds of customers. Let me give you an example. Let's do a little exercise, shall we? Let's do a short exercise. Think about this. Imagine tonight all of Coca-Cola's factories, their bottling capacity, their plant, their machinery, maybe even their trucks, everything goes up in flames. There's a fire, everything all around the world, globally, is gone. How likely is it that Coca-Cola can obtain financing to start operations again tomorrow? If it's likely, raise your hand. So how likely is it that they can obtain financing to start operations? So a significant proportion. Let's take the second half of the thought experiment. Thunder. <laughs> so imagine, imagine that somewhere in the Ural Mountains there is a weapons research laboratory that begins to leak a colorless, odorless gas that envelops the entire planet overnight. And its only effect is to create partial amnesia among 7 billion consumers so that they forget the brand name Coca-Cola and all of its associations overnight. Now, how likely is it that Coca-Cola can obtain financing to start operations again tomorrow? If it's likely, raise your hand. Nobody. In other words, the most important asset, the competitive advantage that Coca-Cola has created over the last 125 years of operation is not the factory, not the bottling capacity, not its physical assets. The most important asset that Coca-Cola has created over the last 125 years of operation resides in the marketplace outside the building, inside the minds of customers, in the connection with customers. That is its competitive advantage. And those seven steps are what Chinese <coughs> firms need to do in order to answer the question, what's next? And those seven steps are not easy. Let me show you a second <coughs> video, short video. Retention and satisfaction. Two, 
Which of your activities do your customers most value? Which ones are they most likely to pay a premium for? Which ones are the reasons for their loyalty? Where do these activities reside on the upstream downstream spectrum? And three, what differentiates you from your competitors? Where is this differentiation located? What is the source of your competitive advantage? Consider a company that outsources its production and logistics and invests instead in retail, big data, customer management, and customer interface activities. This company is tilting its center of gravity downstream. Your business's center of gravity relative to your competitors can determine your competitiveness. In the pharmaceutical industry, despite bad protection for new molecules, it is the companies that have clubs with the physicians and patients that are in the driver's seat. It is they who acquire the biotechnology startups or buy the established player with patent portfolios, and rarely the other way around. In many industries today, the center of gravity is shifting downstream. The downstream cost of customer acquisition, customer satisfaction, and customer retention have ballooned, while the upstream cost of manufacturing, product development, and supply chains have been shed. Activities customers consider valuable and are willing to pay for also tend to be downstream, while products and production are seen as similar across competitors. A business that does not tilt with its industry may find itself competing in commoditized playing fields with little influence on why customers buy. Take control of your center of gravity. Want to know how? Tilt is a book about how companies in industry after industry are shifting their center of gravity. Now, let me ask you to repeat the exercise. So in your row, ask yourself the following question. Now, it's a slightly different question from the one that we started off with. The question is, which company is most likely to be able to execute all seven steps? Repeat the same answer. Let's, let's see. So take, take a few moments to discuss this in your role. Which company is most likely to be able to execute all seven steps? <laughs>
Euro, 10 cent, or you over 10 cent. No, 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 no company can achieve all seven. That's an interesting answer. Yeah, wonderful. So we have reached consensus that Alibaba may. Yes. Okay. All right. <laughs> okay, Francis. Enrico. Uh, we ten cents Ali Alibaba. Ten cents Alibaba. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay. David. Ten cents. Ten cents. What do we have here? No consensus. No consensus. Interesting. All right. Stephanie. Alibaba. Alibaba, sorry. Alibaba, right, okay. Alibaba. Lee Ning. Lee Ning, all right. Alibaba and Hyatt. Alibaba and Hyatt, okay. WeChat. WeChat, which is Tencent, yeah. Wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. But you know what? You dropped Lenovo. So so let me let me let me first of all, let me thank you for your attention. You, you know, and, and your participation in the in the exercises. And let me introduce and invite uh, Amy Wong to come up and speak to us. Amy uh, is Ivy, uh, an Ivy alumna through and through. Amy was an undergraduate student from 2000 to 2002 at the Ivy campus in uh, Canada and a EMBA, executive MBA student here in Hong Kong, uh, graduated in 2013, 14, just graduated. Amy has a brand of advertising background. She worked for 10 years on the agency side, uh, working with Ogilvy. One of the, you know, no, it is one of the four advertising agencies in the world that claims to be the largest. <laughs> <laughs> and so she worked with Ogilvy in New York, and she worked on the Watson account. You know Watson, the supercomputer from IBM? So she's very familiar with the computer industry, with, uh, with, uh, the, uh, with, with the IBM. And so when she moved to Hong Kong about three years ago, uh, she started to work with Lenovo. And she now runs the brand and advertising for Lenovo for all of Asia. Please help me welcome Amy Wong.
branded under the, we call the yoga brand. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with it. Um, but uh, we have a laptop that basically has a 360 degree hinge, um, which you can stand, you could use it in four different modes. So a laptop, a tablet, um, you can stand it or uh, in a triangular uh, fashion. So you can use it in different ways. And then um, we also have a tablet that's called a Lenovo Yoga tablet, um, which has a uh, stand, like a, a kickstand that you can hold onto and read. So that is actually a result of a lot of customer research um, because uh, I guess iPad is a pretty awesome product, but um, a lot of complaints are that you know you hold it, you try to read, and then your arm gets tired, and then it falls on your face. So we got. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, if you have like a you know, nosebleed, so um, actually. <laughs> Research. Um, we thought, okay, this this uh, handle can be more comfortable for customers to hold on to if they want to read it for a long time. It turns into a stand, so you can um, sit it on the table and you can watch um, like a movie or watch YouTube. Um, so we're slowly making that transition um, from being a very manufacturing focused company. Um, it's very much at, at that point in time three years ago. Um, our uh, mix is very entry level, so a lot of things we're selling was very um, value for money, I guess what they call it. Um, but now we're starting to move into more premium and higher end products as a result of understanding better what the customers are looking for. So um, we'll see what happens. Hopefully Lenovo ends up back on your list at some point. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, I, I guess uh, I didn't prepare anything specifically, but um, I'm, op I'm open to any questions you guys may have. Anything on that list of seven that you think the company should do? Oh, um, I think the um, the first and second step are really important. Um, finding the wave and then defining that wave. So, um, I mean, it's a little bit difficult for um, our company because it's traditionally about um, hardware, um, where a lot of the companies that you guys are naming are very much, you know, uh, cloud software based, app based. Um, which is clearly where kind of uh, where people, all the consumers are uh, going these days. Um, but I guess within the hardware company or within the hardware space, um, what is that wave that we can catch and how do we define it? I think yoga, that that brand that we're trying to push, is a good um, example of that kind of within within that space because uh, you know clearly a lot of our competitors have similar products, but I think we do the best job at marketing it. Um, and, and making it our own. So um, I think those first two would be the things that we should focus on. Yeah. Uh, and I have a question. So we, uh, we, we actually looked at Lenovo as part of our class last weekend. And then I was uh, doing the whole internet research. It's because uh, I grew up in China. That that brand, I think, for, for mainland Chinese, um, it, it like a special emotional attachment to it. And, um, and what I didn't realize um, was uh, the, the start. The, the beginning part of the beginning starting years of the company, the founders were are all actually part of like kind of a government owned think tank. Mm -hmm. So even though later on it became known as more of a hardware manufacturing company, but that was only because at the time, so it's almost like they were, you know, finding a way, catching a wave at the time, or defining a way for China at least, is they realized, you know what, you know, this is computer's gonna be big, you know, you know, we are gonna have the government capital, let's let's do X versus Y. And you know, and, and computers have so it feels like I, I don't know. I, I think there is that still that DNA mm -hmm. in the company if you dig deep enough mm -hmm. um, to you know to find a way to integrate that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Definitely, because uh, it's, it's it's an asset, it's intangible. But yeah. that's a, that's a history that I feel maybe people forget about it because it's, it's quite sad. Yeah. It, I mean, um, yeah. It, Lenovo is definitely like a national, there's like the national pride for that company. Um, and then that when we looked at growing the, the brand uh, globally, uh, the way we did it kind of skipped a few steps. We, we purchased IBM's uh, ThinkPad division, or uh, not ThinkPad, but the PC division. So that kind of helped us uh, accelerate um, the, the growth of our brand globally. 
um, but still a lot of uh, the rest of the world doesn't know the brand that well, I would say. Um, we, we launched um, a brand consideration study, which um, it measures, you know, if you were to purchase a computer in the next um, three months or six months, which brand comes to mind, and it's usually Apple. Um, and so uh, basically for the rest of the world, and it was really not that well known, or they're known for being a value brand. And trying to get out of that mindset um, is really quite tough. Um, and then especially when you're com um, competing against Samsung, which invests so much money um, in, in marketing. I think it's something like um, 12 billion, if I'm not mistaken. Um, 14, 14 now, which is more than, I think, McDonald's and Coca-Cola, and there's another brand combined. So trying to compete with a juggernaut like that is, is really tough. So we have to be more creative in the way we do so. Um, but yeah, to your point, uh, the, the company did you know, have that, we do have that DNA, but um, our products are also, in a way, they're commoditized. 